How much alcohol is left in your food after you cook with it? Short answer, almost all of it, or almost none of it, depending on how you cook it. Let us to the science building and consult with my colleague, Dr. Garland Crawford, chemistry professor at Mercer University. According to the literature, depending on what you're looking at and some of your, your technique you're using, uh, what we do know is there's always going to be some residual amount of alcohol left. This stands in contrast with what many of the world's great chefs erroneously believe, including my beloved Marco Pierre White. We put the second batch of sauté in, brought it up to the boil. You want no reduction as the second sauté? No, just brought to the boil, just to burn off the alcohol. Yes, alcohol boils off at a little lower temperature than water, but that doesn't mean it boils off instantaneously. I mean, think about it. When you bring a pot of water to a boil, does the water suddenly just go poof and vanish? Nah, evaporating alcohol takes time and heat, and it's mostly going to be a function of volume. By how much volume do you reduce that alcohol? If you only reduce it a little bit, there's going to be a lot of alcohol left in the finished product, says science. In a 1992 study, researchers cooked a bunch of hilariously old-fashioned recipes from the Pillsbury Kitchen's cookbook, 1979. Found it on eBay. So here, they made Cherries Jubilee, a tablespoon of cornstarch mixed with a 16-ounce can of cherries. A quarter cup of brandy went in, and then they flambéed it. Beautiful. Total cooking time of the booze was 48 seconds, and how much of the alcohol was left at the end? 77 to 78 percent. And the alcohol burns off so quickly. Yeah, not that quick, Gordon, but it does burn off a lot faster than water. It reduces by what we call a power function, which means there's an exponential piece to it. Um, so it actually is a multiplying effect as you, as you reduce it by a greater volume. This is why the same researchers had a very different experience when they cooked a pot roast Milano with one cup of nice burgundy in it. So 70s. Look, it says to serve the pot roast with spaghetti. They simmered that pot roast for two and a half hours, and how much alcohol from the wine was left at the end? Just four to six percent. So what does this mean for you? Are you going to get buzzed off of your food? Chances are probably pretty small. Uh, as it turns out, uh, even with the per percentages of alcohol that are in many of the cooked down solutions, you have to take in a lot of that in order to have an effect. For example, even those super boozy Cherries Jubilee only had two grams of alcohol per serving in the finished product. One beer has about 14 grams of alcohol in it. Two grams isn't going to do anything to you. Your body is able to metabolize alcohol at a pretty steady rate. Uh, we predict about 10 grams an hour or so. And let's consider food that's been cooked a lot longer. Garland did the math on that pot roast Milano and found that. In order to get the same effect as a beer, we need about 25 pounds of pot roast to have that same effect. That's a lot of pot roast. But let's say you're a person who, for whatever religious or moral reason, fully abstains from alcohol. Should you also abstain from a long simmered sauce like my bolognese with white wine in it? Even though the alcohol content is probably down to almost nothing by the end. If you don't want to consume a single ethyl alcohol molecule, then yeah, you shouldn't eat my sauce. But I've got even more bad news for you, because you're probably consuming similarly small quantities of alcohol all the time. Why? Because alcohol is in bread. Anything fermented. Yeast make booze. It's what they do. In 1926, two chemists at Cornell College in Iowa, quote, collected 12 samples of ordinary bread from bakeries and housewives' ovens, and after chemical analysis found that the alcohol content in this prosaic food varied between 0.04 to 1.9%. That means that some of that bread was technically in violation of the prohibition law that was in effect in the United States at the time. Here's some more recent research. In 1998, scientists at the University of Washington analyzed the alcohol content of a bunch of store-bought baked goods, like Wonder Bread and Twinkies. Yes, Twinkies have alcohol in them. These scientists were trying to figure out if a person could blow a false positive on a breathalyzer test if they had a mouthful of Twinkie, which is a pretty fun scenario to imagine. Hey, my taxes pay your salary. <sighs> Look back over here at Garland's math. That pot roast that had the wine in it, it has one third of the alcohol of Wonder Bread. You would get drunk from Wonder Bread three times faster. But that would never happen, of course, because you'd throw up before you ate enough pot roast or Wonder Bread. According to my own calculations, you'd have to eat about 1,400 Twinkies to equal one beer. That's a big Twinkie. 
Now look, I'm no theologian. I'm not going to try to connect all the moral dots for you, but here's something that I would think about if I was a person whose religion told me to abstain from alcohol. I might ask myself, what's the reason behind that? Is it because the ethyl alcohol molecule is just inherently bad? Or is it because my religion doesn't want me to get intoxicated? Because when I get intoxicated, I become disinhibited and therefore less likely to follow all of the other moral tenets of my religion. That's what I might think about, but as always, you do you, friend. Now, maybe you don't want to buy wine because you don't want to support that industry, or you don't want to be tempted by that bottle as it stares at you from the cupboard. Me, I'll continue to put cheap Pinot Grigio in just about everything I cook. What's that? You want me to put you on Lucky Charms?